Hey everyone, and welcome to the Marketing Times Analytics Podcast. Today, I'm on with Matt Farnsworth. Matt, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hey, I'm Matt Farnsworth. Uh, I am the Director of the Digital Experience at Transamerica. I am the CEO of a company called Revelation Media, and I'm also a filmmaker. Yeah, so you're definitely on the creative side of everything we talk about when we're talking about marketing, and I I'm curious... How did you get started in all of this? What's your sort of career journey like? Oh, man. Do, you... <laughs> Do how long you got? <laughs> long enough. <laughs> all right. I'm, 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 I'm getting to be an old timer now. So it's, it's been about 20, I spent about 22 years in Hollywood. And I, I started out, I went there when I was, at, I was 20, 21 years old. And I hit the, the streets of LA and I went and I, I just started, you know, auditioning and going to agents and sort of begging to get in and um, was in the acting world. I was writing, did a couple TV shows, national TV shows. I did some movies. I screen tested for a lot of, a lot of stuff. I mean, you, you name it, I've been there um, in, in, in every room you could imagine in that business from Paramount Pictures, Universal, all over. So I kind of cut my teeth on being rejected and I was always creating. I've always been a, a very, you know, creative person, a writer. And I ended up wanting to make my own pictures because I got kind of fed up with the system and what was sort of demanded of you personally in Hollywood. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those places where you, you, you really do the deal or you don't. You do the deal with the devil or you don't. And, and I, I just, I, I, I didn't want to go there. So I, I decided to make my own films and that was great. It, it was a learning curve, like, like nobody's business. I mean, you, you get thrown into the fire when you decide to make your own film and you come up with the funding and it's all on you. And so when you're dealing with a million dollars and it's on your head and you're directing, you're producing, you're writing, you learn really quick how to manage relationships. And, you know, when you don't have a, back end, you know, um, distribution plan, you learn really quickly that you needed one and you needed a marketing plan, by the way, before you even started. So, you know, I, th I think you, you learn through your failures. So that's kind of where I, I, I grew up and, you know, became accountable and started to make some, some good projects, had one project that has over 10 million downloads, probably more now. God only knows how many downloads that actually has considering piracy, but there's been some, some good projects. And then I had a really horrible uh, experience. We can talk about that um, if you want to, as we go along and it sort of changed my career path. And I ended up talking to a friend out here in Knoxville, Tennessee, who owns a owned a third party administrator company, which is a, company that administers retirement plans, 401k plans. And he said he needed some help just with marketing in general. And so I decided to help him out. And I found that I kind of enjoyed that aspect. I had done a lot of marketing on social media because of the films. And I had grown fan bases to over half a million followers on social media. So I had an idea of how to talk to an audience and it wasn't much different than targeting a different audience. So I started to work with him and the company grew and it grew a lot. And in fact, Transamerica, which I'm not, which I'm now an employee of ended up buying the company. And in that process offered me the position of the director of digital experience. So here I sit, you know, doing this, this job and that's where we're at current day. It sounds like it must have been very difficult to predict where you would end up based off of where you started. Would you say that you kind of um, took sort of a opportunistic path in your career to where the opportunity lied rather than sort of trying to pre-structure? Yeah, I would say nothing was ever pre-structured with me. I, I went for it. You know, I saw something I desired and I, I enjoyed and I did it and I did it to the fullest. I mean the fullest, like star in a movie, fullest, direct a movie that goes to Tribeca, fullest. 
um, direct a movie and star in a movie that's in movie theaters. You know, I just, I would go and I would go hard and until it, <laughs> till the wheels fell off. And then I would move to the, to the next thing. And, and I would do all of it because I find that in creativity, it's good to, to be doing many things, not just one. Because it becomes very stale when you do just one. You can't focus on one thing for too long. You actually need to step away from it and then come back to it. So I've kind of always done that. And I keep coming back to making movies and I'm writing one right now. So I, I just, I don't really stop. I've just got sort of a web of things I'm working on out there creatively. And I, I when I have the inspiration, I go to them and I work on them. Interesting. So do, how do you decide what you should be working on? Well, I have priorities that I have to have in a structured corporate environment. And I enjoy that aspect. When you're a creative person and you can apply yourself in a corporate setting and learn the language, you're going to advance yourself tremendously because it does provide a structure and it creates an analytical pathway in your mind that really opens you up creatively in other avenues. I know that sounds strange, but it's how creativity works. And a lot of my outside Transamerica work that I do, like writing screenplays or doing my own videos, um, YouTube videos, whatever it is I feel like creating, they, those inspirations come usually right before I fall asleep or at two or three o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Hmm. That's when it happens. And I, I know you have to get up and you have to write it down. There will be times I'm having a conversation with people and I'll just walk away because something came to me and, and people know that they know, Oh, never mind, Just don't even bother. He's going to be gone for a half an hour writing something down. And I have to do that because if I don't, I've learned that I won't remember it and I'll want to remember it. But the, when the channel comes through, you, you got to take it. You got to take it. So, so, yeah, say more about that. So, so this channel, like how, how do you view creativity? Do you, do you view it as sort of like the universe speaking to you? How much of it is your own practice and, and kind of fostering creativity versus sort of being imbued with creativity? Well, I think that you can do a lot to, to tune your instrument, right? You're an instrument and all of us are creative, all, all of us. You're a creative person. You, you, you know, just look at your backdrop, look at what you've got going on. I mean, you, you created all this and you channeled it from somewhere. There was an inspiration. I think everything comes from inspiration. It comes from what we've seen. It comes from our experience. And based on that experience, we can learn to tune our instrument, to quiet our instrument enough to allow either a large volume or a small volume of creative energy to flow in. And I, over the years, fought it hard. You know, I fought it hard. I, I, I was, I've always been very creative and I've had trouble with that addiction issues, you know, problems in my life because of my creativity, because of feeling too much. And I think there's a lot of artists out there and creative people out there that we know of. I mean, obviously you see about it and then you see it in the news all the time. Uh, people ODing, people having issues with drug and alcohol abuse, mental illness, because they feel so much that they're trying to quiet it. So I think once you can start to listen to that internally and channel it in a positive way and understand it and also not be offended by people not liking your ideas when you present them because everyone's going to have a different viewpoint. A lot of times artists become very attached to their creative ideas. I learned not to. I'm creating it for me. And then in terms of, to answer your question, Specifically, tuning the instrument would be a, a ritual or a, a something like I said. If I have an idea late at night, I'm about to fall asleep. 
I ritualistically will wake myself up and train myself to wake myself up and do that. A lot of people will just fall back asleep. I've learned that some of my best ideas come from that space and I can't help it. I am 100% propelled to wake up. I, I cannot stop myself. So I just listen to that creative process now and I don't fight it. And I don't fight the whisper that I have, which is my intuition, which when I was younger, I would fight my intuition, you know, and now I don't, I actually listen to it. I'm curious. So if you are focused on the creative side, how do you approach building the business side of skills to complement your creativity? Well, I was always very creative, but I also had, um, I had a, a, a dad who was a very successful businessman. I grew up in a business setting. I grew up in a structured setting. I understand that and I apply it. So I think what we're talking about here is, is dipping into two different worlds. I just happen to be one of those people who can organize a presentation I need to give next month on the 2023 digital strategy that we're looking at to our pool plan team. Right. So I don't, I don't falter when it comes to that type of situation. My brain can still function analytically. Whereas I think someone who is like just an artist that just paints or something, you know, that it's different. It's a different kind of art, um, a singer, maybe somebody like that. And sometimes those people know the back end of pro tools and how to operate their own nowadays people know how to create their own music so i think we're all adapting and learning and and just my my background again is something that has always been business focused making movies selling them producing and when you talk about producing that there's an art to that as well there's a lot of structure when it comes to budget there's a lot of structure when it comes to line producing a film getting locations agreements, understandings with actors, casting. It's, it's not just a, a fun creative process. It's, it's a business. Um, so I'm curious how, how you even got started in all of this. Like when you were, let's say, going back to high school, how did high school Matt decide he wants to go into this world? Well, I didn't have a lot that I liked. I, I sort of liked a lot of things, I guess. I, I I was none too pleased with high school. I was very bored. I just thought it was really mundane and honestly a waste of time. So I really wanted to, you know, learn more. And I knew I had known computer. I'd always worked with computers because my, like I said, my dad was, um, he worked for IBM in the early days. And so I had one of the very first computers at my house. So I'd been operating word processors and computers forever. But how I got into it, it was just by accident. I ended up, I was an athlete. I ended up injuring myself in, in college, my first or second year of college. And one of the counselors there said, why don't you just take a drama class? I was like, no, I don't really want to do that. That sounds lame. He's like, no, just do it because, you know, you can't really do a lot of activity, but you're not going to be sitting in a situation where you've got to sit for two or three hours. You'll actually be up and active. So I did it and I really liked it. And I ended up in a play very early on in Seattle, um, like months after I'd done that. And, and within three or four months, I was already in L.A. I was done. I'd just taken off, moved to L.A. And within... Two or three months in LA, I had an agent and I was already auditioning. Wow. Mm -hmm. So it sort of swept you away. You fell in love with it. It was great. It was a creative outlet. You know, I really enjoyed the opportunity to make money and be creative. I thought, I think those are fantastic. If you can do something you love and make a living doing it, that's fantastic. I bought a house in LA. I mean, it was like a dream, right? You go out there, you national TV show, you do a TV show. I mean, you screen test for 13 pilots the first year you're there. You screen test for Star Wars. I mean, what, you know, like you do all this crazy stuff that most people don't get to do in their lifetime. And 
it's incredible. It's it, it, then there's the dark side of it, right? There's always the dark side of something, but that part of it was really fun. Was it difficult to appreciate in the moment when you were accelerating your career? How did how did you adapt to that level of success? Well, I didn't really consider it a giant success. Um, I, I never, I just, I really enjoyed it, but I didn't love it because I didn't like the lifestyle. I didn't like having to be on set 15, 16 hours. And I really was kind of wanted to do it on my own terms. And <laughs> that was, that was difficult because you know, when you want to do it on your own terms, there's a lot you have to give up in order to, um, you know, make it. And I just, there were just things I wasn't willing to do and the things you don't even want to hear about, to be honest. It, it, Hollywood really does have a, a dark side that really turned me off. Wow. So, yeah, so I mean, you, you just, you, you know, you learn. And, and, and I mean, looking back, I don't regret it. I wouldn't, you know, just, I don't regret not taking it that next step. And I'm, it doesn't bother me. I, I, I love my life now. I'm really happy. And I'm thankful that I actually didn't do some of the things that were presented to me at the time. I was offered to, you know, date A-list celebrities. But I had, a, at the time, a child on the way with um, my ex-wife. And I really didn't want to just leave. But I had big agents. I had people that... I think my agent became the head of CAA, but he was at William Morris at the time. I was at William Morris. And he just, you know, they offered me things. They offered, you know, that deal to go out and get yourself out there in the public eye by dating somebody who's probably the top actress at the time. And I just, I didn't want to do it. I looked at it and said, yeah, but the last guy who dated her just died. And I said, I don't know if that's my path. Wow. So I just kind of set it aside. I said, nah, I'm just going to go make my own movies and continue doing what I'm doing. And, and um, you know, it led me here. I did, I did go through a difficult time, as I stated, but I don't think that's because I was upset that I didn't do things in Hollywood. I, that's not, that wasn't my concern. I was more uh, having, you know, addiction issues and things like that. And I ended up in a pretty bad car accident. I flipped a car six times, broke my neck, my wingtip vertebrae about s seven years ago now. And that is when the career path started to change. I said, I got to do something different. And I moved out of LA and I moved down South to Orange County and I changed my life. I just started, I started training people. I actually started weightlifting and I started getting into, you know, bodybuilding heavily and just, just change things up. Wow. Do you think that you would have made the same level of change if you hadn't had such a, you know, chaotic twist in your, in your life? What, what do you, I'm what glad do you I have that twist. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I mean, I was, I, I didn't drink for about 13 years. And I, I say I'm either really good at drinking or really bad at it, but I think it's both. <laughs> and so I, after 13 years was making a movie, we were in a, place called Panama Joe's, which is in a, a place called Belmont Shore in Long Beach. And I had a house right around the corner. We're making this movie and they're walking around with tequila shots. And I just, after 13 years, grabbed one off that tray and slammed it like it was nothing. Without even a thought. And I hadn't had a drink in 13 years. But things were already declining in my relationship at that time with my then wife. And uh, it just got worse. And we ended up separating and that was not because of my alcohol, you know, use. It was, you know, um, it was a strange time, but I ended up in that accident. I ended up in a probation approved rehab for six months. I lived there and I got to tell you, the weirdest thing happened. I was used to living in a nice house in Belmont Shore, really great area. Actually, it's, it's a cool area of Long Beach. There's a lot of bars, but <laughs> I ended up really happy and calm in this rehab with a guy who's, you know, in his late fifties next to me snoring, who just 
you know, beat his wife's boss up with a baseball bat because she was having an affair and he's in there too. And we're, I'm in this place that's just, I've never lived like that where I'm just reduced to this lowest I've been, broken neck, huge gash on my forehead. I think I had 20 staples in my forehead. I mean, you can still kind of see the scar. And really humbled, really humbled. And that's when things started to change. That's when... I started to hit my knees and be like, look, I got to stop this. Like, I can't, I can't keep, I got to change. Things need to change. And I, I actually, it took a while too. It wasn't immediate. I mean, I was still stubborn. Even, even in there, I was stubborn for a while until I finally accepted that, you know, maybe it is time to change. And I did, I did eventually. But, yeah, I, I don't think things would have changed to answer your question if I hadn't had that. I think they would have been, better they would have eventually gotten better but i don't think i would have had this kind of transformation in my character if i hadn't had that experience and i wouldn't take it back yeah so so you kind of switched into a much more business focused role in this second chapter and i'm curious how did you build the skills like you know you you mentioned that you were put into this sort of director role. How was the adjustment for you? How, how did you learn to succeed in that role? I've had good people with me. I've had supporters. The, the buddy of mine that runs that ran Tag Resources is, is a great guy. And he supported me throughout this. And he be, well, he believed in the talent that I had. And I really had to work day in and day out to, you know, four o'clock in the morning, 4 a.m. reading. I had to understand how the business worked because when you're talking about retirement and 401ks and Secure Act 2.0 and legislation, you, you've got to learn it. You got to understand at least from a 30,000 foot level how it operates so you can help sell it. And so what I did is I just invested my time in, in understanding how it worked. And, and where, where I started was with the marketing materials, I, I analyzed them because I was working on developing the look and, you know, the, the colors and the logos. I was working on the design of how it all worked. And, and in that process, I would take in and I would read it constantly. I would read it to the point I probably read it more than the people who were selling it. So it really, it really just takes focus and really just like the classic things and you, and you, you know, you, you made it happen, um, not just by yourself, but by having really good people around you who believed in you. Yeah. I think that's key is having aligning yourself with people that believe in you, which is hard to find. And also providing a service that helps when your service is what you have to offer helps solve a problem or helps to move the needle. There was a time where this company that I was helping, which is why I started my company, Revelation Media, it was before I even started work, working with them, was to help them, you know, to move the needle. But you got, you got to find something that you know helps people with a problem they have or offers them a service that they need that helps to sell and move the needle because that's what people want when you're talking about marketing and marketing's hard because marketing is one of those fluctuating things. It's one of those, <laughs> you know, how people talk about marketing where they always say, there's no way to quantitate what's happening. How do we look at the numbers and say, well, sales increased X amount because of marketing. But I think that you, you, you know, you can do that. There's a way to do that. I think the analytics are really important when it comes to marketing. And I'm actually that nerd too. I actually get into and dig the concept of anything that I build. I like to see heat maps. I want to know where people clicked. I want to know when they clicked off. I want to understand the demographics. I want to understand conversions. I want to know what's working and what's not working. I want to do A-B testing. I'm all into all that too. So, you know, I got thrown into the fire, but I learned quick. And I attribute that obviously to my earlier days being attached to the computer really early on and always having one and sort of being in on the social media scene when it first popped up. And I've just kind of always been poking away. 
Yeah, the the more that I've become familiar with marketing, the more simple it it appears because there's only so many metrics that can even be collected when you're talking about analytics in marketing. You know, there's you know three funnel stages and there's like one or two KPIs per funnel stage. So it's it's really like a straightforward process in a sense. I'm I'm curious what what are some of the most impactful types of analytics that you look at when you're measuring marketing? Well, I think a conversion mess messaging conversions. I look at the sites and I say, here is where people moved when they came to a landing page. And on that landing page, they spent five seconds reading the top intro heading. Here's what we're, you know, here, here's a solution we can, here's a problem we can solve for you. Um, here's how we're going to do it. Click here and we're going to get you started. Well, I look at those statistics up top and I see how long they spent reading that first quote, see if it pulled them in. If it didn't, we've got to rearrange it. Um, and, and the idea is, is to get them to click, to get them to book. And if that's a video, usually it's a video. I, I typically work on video, as you can imagine. I will place a video at the top of a, a landing page. And I do a lot of custom work for, you know, branding, tiered marketing, co-branding, channel marketing systems. And I really like the idea of being able to convert somebody on a page that is specifically dedicated to one service versus a website, which is dedicated to a lot of different services. You go to a website, it's like, we offer websites, we offer you know, email marketing, we offer video production, we offer all these different things. But when you're working with a company, it's just one service, right? You're offering a service or a product and you wanna focus on the aspects that are gonna solve a problem for the client or the target you're going after. So I think detailing that message is really important because that's what you're there for is to get clients in to convert leads, gain interest and get eyeballs on your brand. Right. Yeah. It sounds like you've been able to use a lot of the t skills that you learned in your creative career in your, um, in your marketing role. So just understanding the purpose and uh, delivery of content and how it actually changes somebody's perspective towards uh, a product service. Yeah. And, and even especially how you first structure it. I, I was watching this really cool uh, YouTube video last night. That was the Whopper. Have you seen the moldy Whopper? I, I don't think so. Maybe, okay. maybe it sounds familiar. I, I feel like I've seen a video of like a Whopper, uh, like getting moldy, but I, I don't know. Yeah, they did like a 30-day time lapse on a Whopper and let it mold. And then they used that as promotion. And the concept was we use fresh food. We use fresh ingredients. Initial reaction, disgusting, gross. They thought it was just a big mistake. Okay. Six months later, 28% more people would consider going to Burger King and an 18% increase in sales. But at first it looked like a total failure, right? It looked like this is a mess. But through the analytics, they learned that there was actually a smashing success. So I think where, why I'm saying that is that there's, when you're creative, the CMO who came up with that campaign is obviously very creative. That's a creative concept and it's also a risk. So I think there's creativity and risk-taking doesn't always pay off, but I think those two things kind of go hand in hand, right? And that's where I come from. I come from a place of, I'm always a little bit edgy. I'm always, you know, the guy they'll call in to maybe help with the fun, the new, the, say they want to close a deal for finals and they want to make a video look really cool, right? They'll call me and they'll say, let's do this. Do you have 10 days? Can you put something together? And we'll figure out an animated video, a script that I write that, we offer to a company that helps them to, you know, sell to their, their participants. Right. So that, that's kind of where I fit in. I fit in like the, what, it, what is it like? It's almost like 
a fixer. Or, I don't know, somebody who comes in creatively and just sort of helps to handle things to push a deal through. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever uh, taken too big of a risk and it burned you? And, you know, in term, from a creative perspective? Well, not so far since I've started working in corporate. I'm, I'm a lot more careful in the corporate world. We haven't had the opportunity yet, but I believe we will. And I, I wouldn't be afraid to take that risk. Let's put it that way. You would, you would not see me being afraid to do that. And I will, I'm sure. Hopefully I get the opportunity. The idea of corporate is you're, you got to be a team player and you have to understand the system and you have to be able to work with a lot of different people. So to get one idea through is kind of a miracle sometimes. And I've managed to do it, but it's a lot of work. You have to make sure that you, you know, cross all those T's. You got to dot all those I's. You got to get that stuff through compliance, make them your best friend. You need to, you know, talk with different departments and make sure different departments are looped in and that they know what's happening. And it's a, it's a real collaboration because when you look at a big company, they're, they're like a cruise ship. You're trying, if you're going to try to turn that cruise ship even a little bit, you got to have a whole team to take it in a different direction. You're not going to be able to be able to do that alone. So I think that that's, that, that slows down the giant opportunity sometimes for a big creative risk. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, but, but you got to kind of, get it in there and, and figure out how to really manipulate it to get that, to get that through or have a lot of power, which I'm in a pretty powerful position and I don't take that lightly. And I don't want to see the company in any way not have success. So I, I like to follow, I like to work with my colleagues. They're great people. They're highly intelligent and I respect their opinions. So I don't often take a lot of huge creative risks without input. Mm -hmm. Speaking of which, what are your inputs when you're thinking about, let's say, a video for a company or a script? Are you, are, do you make sure you know who the audience is? What is their, like, who, who is the actual person that's viewing this? Do you focus on that when you're going through this creative process? Or what does it sort of look like for you? What's, what's going on when you're brainstorming these ideas? 100%. You, you, the reason why you're making that video is to target the person or the people or the company that you're targeting. So the first thing is, who's the target? Is it small businesses? Okay, it's small businesses. Do they need a retirement plan? Yeah, they do. Then you start to define well, what problems could we solve for that target that they currently have, right? And then you look at, well, they're probably understaffed, probably have an HR manager that's trying to manage the 401k right now. Well, let's talk about how we can take the burden off of them, right? And let's start, to, let, let's figure out all the ways we can show them that we can help so they can get time back. Th that would be where my brain would go immediately if I were targeting small business 401k. Now there's other you know, avenues. If I'm a, you know, fitness coach and I want to make my YouTube videos pop, you want to get really specific in your niche and it might be, you know, just bodybuilding alone is not going to cut it. Right. And not anymore. You have to get really specific and you have to say, well, I don't train, you know, I, I train businessmen who, who travel, you know, two weeks out of the year and need to hop on a call with me and do a workout on the go. And I also provide meal plans for people that travel often. Then you get, you get more specific about it. And I would say, then you know your target and you start to define that target until it's really, really down to the granular level. And I think you're going to see more success than just broad. I do bodybuilding. I train, you know, I train anyone. No. Maybe it's, maybe you train morbidly obese people and you specifically focus on that and you, you, you focus your whole career on helping people who are really overweight, lose a hundred pounds. And that's your marketing tactic. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
Yeah, that's really interesting. So you need to have a good understanding of the world if you want to be able to zoom in on a particular audience and think from their perspective about what's going to resonate. It just it requires like a general like a general understanding of the world. I think you I mean you you definitely can't be like you know just living in a small town and not traveling and not meeting people. Um, I'm sure just like your networking itself helps inform your ability to think from different perspectives. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's, it's funny, there, I mean, there probably is people that live in small towns that know their niche in that small town. I think it's really about figuring out what is your niche. What, you know, and sometimes it falls into your lap. Sometimes you just, it's just, you work and you work and then you learn what it is that you, what your niche is. I think defining a target is really key. I mean, it's critical in all of marketing. You won't find, I don't think, a marketer out there that's successful that would tell you that the target doesn't matter. No, it absolutely matters. It's a really important thing. And knowing the world and understanding how people operate, what makes people buy, what incentivates people to you know, pull out their wallet and you know, hand you their credit card for a service that you provide is really important. And if you don't have a lot of world experience, it's, you're right. It's probably not as easy. How do you learn about the world in a broad, broadly? Well, for me, I was lucky enough to be able to travel a lot from a pretty young age. I also was moved a lot when I was a kid. I, I lived in, I think I was in 13 different schools by the time I'd even graduated from high school. So I met a lot of different people. Yeah. And, and so I think it's really, it's, it's who your parents are, right? How you're brought up, you know, your, your, your availability to travel when you're a young person. But I think that going out there and trying different things when you're young, especially in your twenties, like try it. If you, have a feeling about something, go out there and try it. Try many different things because that's the time to do it. That's the time to make the mistakes. That's the time to just totally screw up and figure out what it is that you like to do and that you're good at. And then in your 30s, start to maybe hone that craft, figure out, start to work in that one specific area that you've kind of narrowed it down to, right? You were really wide to begin with. You're like, okay, I'm going to try all these different things. And then I find a couple things that really start to register with me. And then as I turn 30, 31, 32, I start to figure out here's where I want to, here's where I want to focus. And then, then you start working hard. Then you grind and grind and, and you'll see success start to come. And then in your forties, you're kind of into a flow. But I think trying a lot of things is important. I think you can try things in your thirties and forties. Look, I just totally changed my career, but everything that I had done leading up to that had an impact on what I do now. It's not that far a deviation to go from entertainment and creating videos to being creative and doing marketing, right? It's not that. All of it's kind of performance and marketing, right? How do you how do you meet people? How do you network? Well, I use social media quite a bit. I have um, a pr I've, I've always. I think at one point I had like a couple hundred thousand people on Twitter and I, I deleted that account. I got tired of it. I'm that kind of person where I'm like, oh, I'm sick of it. So I'll delete it. Now looking back, I'm like, why did I delete 200,000 people on Twitter that trended at one point? But I did. Um, you know, I've got a big Facebook following, which Facebook is very underrated right now. Just so you know, the, the, the ads on Facebook are still there, but they're not doing as well. So the ads are really, really affordable. Um, just, I'm, I don't obviously have any affiliation with Facebook, but it's, it's if you want to grow a presence and sell there, you can still sell on that platform. And I have quite a few people on there, like 60,000 people that, and that, that seems to just go like every time I post and I communicate with people on there and I go live stream and it ends up becoming more about mental health. But I learn a lot about people because they post their stories and they tell me what they're going through. Or they talk about marketing or bodybuilding or, you know, there's lots of stuff we talk about, movies we talk about on there. And I, I feel like that's one way that I do communicate with people. And then 
obviously have a great home life. I have a great wife. I, I'm, I'm remarried. I am super happy. My, my life has been, I can't even tell you how great in the last, you know, five years have just had, they've been my most successful years. And I do, I do most of my friendships and my communication through work. And other than that, outside of that, I really don't have a huge friend base. I'm much more family and work. And would you, would your younger self agree with that split of how you socialize or is it something that you came to over time and are now comfortable with? I, I came to that over time. I, I wish I'd done that when I was younger and set aside friends earlier on and just said, yeah, you know, I'm going to have a season of just saying no to you right now because I've got to go get this stuff done and work on myself. But uh, there's codependency. There's things that happen when you're younger and, you know, FOMO and everything, and you end up doing some stupid things, but we all do it. And I'm talking about the friend world here, not the business world. But I think that you got to set that aside. If you really want to have success, hanging out with your friends 24 seven is not going to give you success. That's not where it's at. It, it's going to be, you know, there's networking and that's business. Friends are a different thing. That's a totally different thing. I can see maybe having friends as I'm older and I, you know, maybe start to retire as I get older and maybe vacation or something. I don't know, but I'm, I'm pretty solitary. Um, being as creative as I am, I'm a little bit weird. So I don't think that people love to hang out with me that much, but <laughs> maybe that's just me. <laughs> that's funny you're yeah i mean you're you are like a true creative i think that that is you're by definition a little bit alienated from most people who just by definition think differently than you and have different ways of living oh yeah i mean i'd rather go to a museum than a basketball game but I'm very athletic, which is really weird, but I, I'm super athletic and I always have been. I mean, like, you know, um, all state, everything in high school and, you know, even college soccer. I was about, I was about to start playing college soccer. I just, I just, um, I've always been so inclined to the arts that I would much prefer when I go to Amsterdam to go to, you know, every museum that's there and check out and just drink in the art. And I think that feeds Another question that you asked earlier is how do you tune that creative instrument? It's through reading great works of art. Uh, it's through seeing great works of art. It's through listening to great works of art. That is one of the ways that you keep your instrument in tune. Well, again, museums for sure. That, that's one of the top you know, top things on my list. I mean, you're talking to a guy who in his, you know, early twenties, instead of buying Lakers tickets, which I love the Lakers and I used to watch them all the time, but I would go and buy, you know, season tickets to Essa, Pekka, Salons, um, Dorothy Chandler Pavilion Orchestra. And I would have season tickets to that. And I would go to that and watch Paganini anytime, anytime they had it, you know, or, you know, Strauss, Bach, you, you name it. I would go there and I would do that. And that would be my thing. So if I was going to go out on a date when I was younger. It's like a little weird, right? You got, you, know, you have to be the right, the right person that would want to go to the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion. I wouldn't say that it was ever a terrible thing. It was always different than the local bar, but I had a different taste and I always have had a different taste. And I like a variety of music. Music is a great thing to get you motivated to paint, to work out. We use music to work out. And then movies. Movies are huge. Like I'll watch almost a movie a day if I can. Yeah. What about influencers online, people that talk about business or talk about art and, and marketing? Is there anybody that you recommend people um, follow? Yeah. So you're going to want to pick up a book by... Rick Rubin called the creative act. And I, I really don't care if you're a business guy or you're a, you know, you're a rock star. This is for everyone. And it really is enlightening in terms of the creative process and explaining how it works. And it will help you learn how to channel it. 
it's like it was speaking to me. I mean, I could have probably written passages in this book. It just spoke directly to me. He did a fantastic job. I'm not saying I could write as well as him, but he is, he's incredible. And then you got Gary V out there who's just really going crazy. I mean, he gets, he can be insanely grating on you, but he makes a point, go out there and do the work. It's not going to do it for you. You know, you, you got to grind. There's no doubt. It's a grind. You want to make money. You want to be, a, you want to have a big job. You want to go travel. You want to have nice vacations. You want a nice house. You want these, you got to work for it. It's not just going to fall in your lap. And I think Gary V says that really, really well. And he's also got a lot of great tips about posting to social media. You want to have success on social media? Share constantly. There is no real algorithm. In fact, it favors people who post more often. So you need to be sharing. You should be sharing. And there's nothing wrong with having a shaky video. As long as your messaging is great, I think it's fantastic. Look, I love creative quality. I love the 8K video if I can get it. I love slow motion. I love all the beautiful effects, but is it effective for most normal people to share to social media? Probably not. Does it help your business if you are a if you're a big time player in an organization, should you be sharing to social media on a regular basis? Absolutely. Absolutely. You should make your presence known and you should be supporting your company on social media. So those two guys are great. Um, I love actors too. There's some actors that I really like and directors that I really like. I've always loved Quentin Tarantino. Uh, Denzel Washington has always been probably one of my favorite actors. Um, there's a lot of female stars that I think are amazing actresses. Um, I don't think Kate Blanchett has ever turned in a bad performance. I don't, there's just so much out there that I could say that is, that turn that turns me on when it comes to art that we could go on for the next you know, half an hour. So speaking of art and creativity, I think it's, and it would be interesting to also talk about how artificial intelligence is sort of being introduced into this space and mm -hmm. the way that it, it, it's kind of its strengths and weaknesses. So to what degree do you see AI coming into the creative world and being able to replace certain processes versus what are, what are the going to be the hardest pieces? for it to replace? Well, I think that the soul is what's going to be, you know, the, the irreplaceable element. We have an organic idea, right? And that's something I don't think AI just comes up with this organic concept, right? On its own, it's prompted as far as I know right now. And I personally... I love it. I think it is an organizing genius. It, it has taken a creative person like me and allowed me to channel my creativity and help me to organize my creative thoughts into plans that I can structure and organize in a timeline. So I have no negative feeling about AI at this juncture. Um, I'm really, like I said, a computer nerd, I will just keep, you know, I can, I can go forever. And so I read about chat GPT and I watch all the videos and I even do chat school, right? <laughs> I'm like that into it. And I, I, I don't, I don't know where it's going to go. Sometimes I sit down and I look at the screen and I, I see the cursor blinking and I'm like wondering, who am I talking to? This is kind of spooky. You know, that kind of thing pops up where, I, oh, geez, I mean, it, it just spit out a business plan in like, you know, two minutes. But you got to know what you're doing to prompt it. You got to know what you want. You got it, it. It's not just going to grab your, you know, grab, grab your head and, and push it to the computer screen and, you know, extract information from you. It, <laughs> that's not going to happen you're going to have to be able to organize your thoughts well enough to prompt AI to generate the response that you're going to want that'll be useful for you. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it basically is going to replace the sort of 
I'll, I'll call it the lower level execution, but it won't be able to replace the higher level strategy that requ it is required as an input to what eventually gets executed. Or at least it'll take more time to get that. I mean, you, you basically just were like chat GPT for me. <laughs> I just rambled off a bunch of stuff and you organized it and put it together in a nice sentence or two. And, and that's, I think that's for people like me, well, that's brilliant, isn't it? So I, I don't see it as a negative. Again, I, like I said, I do follow Gary Vee's stuff. And like he's saying, you got to learn it. It's here and it's not going away, right? I mean, how do you see it? Do you, do you use it? Do you like it? I do. Uh, I do use it. And I, I like it a little bit. What, the thing I don't like is th that there's zero originality in AI by definition, because mm -hmm. it's just looking at everything that we've created and it's sort of understanding it's it's drawing like the the average line across all of it you know it looks at like a thousand different articles about you know any given topic and just gives you like the average like response that's like correct and i think that uh it's the epitome of the of smart but not wise because it doesn't know you know the difference between something that's technically correct but like in reality isn't exactly correct um, and something that's just like wrong, um, factually, but well, what, what I'm trying to say is like, um, it, it, it's missing a sort of critical lens. AI is missing a critical lens. It's just like an input output, like the perfect student. It seems like. Yeah. It has no nuance. There, there's no human nuance and we are nuanced creatures. And as you know, have you ever sent a text to somebody and it was misconstrued? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, what's, what's the difference between that and us prompting AI, right? I mean, it, it, you're, not, you're gonna need to know how to prompt it to get, to get what you want out and you're still gonna have to take what it gives you and you're still gonna have to work on it. It's not a perfect science for sure. And I know exactly what you're saying. You'll input a lot of information. You'll get this great, organized, perfect student article back. But you still got to take that and work on it. But it does save me four hours. You know, but I still have to put my touch on it. Otherwise, it's just, you know, it's just computerized AI language. It is. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's still some magic that comes from us you know, developing things ourselves that I yeah. think is, um, it, it's de being devalued as we replace things with AI. Um, just, you know, it, it makes me sort of hope that there's a resurgence one day of human crafted things. Um, you know, because right, right now we're going to try, we're going to race to replace everything with AI and robotics and, there will be. There'll be a return to organic roots of human beings, I believe. And that will, will, how would I explain this? That's an interesting concept. It's like everything's going all digital, even art. And, and there'll be this like retro throwback where there'll be this movement where everybody will want to cre art, create art from scratch with their hands as human beings because they'll just get tired of it. It's possible. But then there's a place in the world for both to live, right? There, I think that's what we have to, to come to is, is, and we don't want to stop. I don't think people in marketing should be really fearful that, hey, their jobs are going to be gone tomorrow or, you know, there's, because I just don't see that right now happening. I, I do know that there are processes that AI, as fast as it's moving, who knows what's going to happen to certain companies and their technology and how that's all going to work. I can't speak to that. I really don't know. I know that that's a different thing than just what you and I are speaking about. I mean, it's rewriting technology. How quick code, how quick, what does that mean? Right. And you've probably seen Elon Musk talk about this a little bit and talk about how much it needs to be slowed down. 
Yeah, I, I think that the uh, sort of cerebral strategy jobs are safe because they will be enhanced by AI because it will AI will always require a human to sort of guide and make sure that it's fitting into processes like you know AI can't just like solve for every single possible outcome it will it will probably always need some kind of like a, a guiding you know guardrail around what it's actually impacting to make you know like supervision and i think that as long as you're in a role where you are you can supervise something that's as executing work i think that the job is going to be safe yeah, I agree. But I do think that if it ever does come to the, the point where that's not needed, we're in big trouble. Yeah. Maybe it really does become like a James Cameron film. Look out. <laughs> it's frightening. Just the idea. I mean, the concept. Yeah, it's going to be cool to listen back on these episodes in a decade and see how things have changed. <laughs> yeah, I would, never make an, I would never make a prediction right now. I, I, I could predict that. Nothing. I could predict nothing about AI. I, I just don't know where it's going. I'd have to do more research to understand it. I do use it and I do like it. And I think it's become a very valuable tool. But soon enough, as you stated, everyone's PowerPoint presentations are going to start to look the same. Everybody's documents are going to start to look the same. Everybody's marketing materials are going to start to look the same because they're taking that creative person out who puts that flair on it who puts that nuance on it that's human. And that is really what drives sales. That's really what helps move the needle. And you can't take that out. You can't take that soul away. Not yet anyway. Yeah, that's, that's great. I, that's a great note to end on, honestly. I, I, I want to thank you, Matt, for coming on. This has been such a great conversation. Great. Thank you. That was wonderful. A lot of fun. Had a great time. Awesome. And thanks, everyone, for listening. We'll talk to you soon.